Hello and welcome to this week's My News Wrap, news from the world of SAP, Microsoft and the world in between. Let's start with some news from the SAP area. I have two blog posts from the SAP community that I would like to highlight here. First one is the um, advent of the Open Documentation Initiative at the area of the SAP Business Technology Platform documentation. So now the um, Business Technology Platform documentation, as well as the Best Practice Guide for SAP BTP, are now um, running under the Open Documentation Initiative. So they are um, editable on, on GitHub, so you can bring in your feedback, you can bring in improvement requests using the usual um, GitHub flow that you might know from Microsoft, or um, there is also a link to how to do that within the blog post that I've referenced within my show notes. So um, BTP is now also part of the game. Um, at the end of the blog post, there are also the other areas that are part of the game. So there is not um, the complete help.scp.com now underlying this open documentation initiative. It's a business application studio, which was the front runner, the product link service, and the administration guide for SAP S4 HANA Cloud for advanced financial closing. Something that is, from my perspective, quite special. Um, don't know if there will be too much feedback there, but maybe there is some vivid community around that. Nevertheless, what is important from my perspective, for BTP, now you can really uh, contribute and make the descriptions better. Then, um, as kind of an aftermath, aftermath of the SAP TechEd, there is one blog post by uh, Matthias Steiner that I would like to highlight about myth busting, no code and low code. And yeah, thanks a lot, Matthias, for this blog post about um, some very important topics or, or misconceptions around no code and low code that um, are often sold together with, with low code, no code, and that absolutely make no sense. Um, and I'm also afraid that the Tacket kind of also, yeah, um, made the error not to, to be quite clear at, at those spots. Nevertheless, now, if you, if you have questions, if you kind of didn't feel, um, or, or felt not, not, um, very uh, good about the announcements and, and what comes with low code, no code, I think this blog post really helps you to put things, um, together the, the right way. So also where are the limitations, for example? Yeah, with that, um, let's switch to the Microsoft part of the house. First of all, serverless, of course. There is one project that I'd like to highlight by Mark Dücker, um, who is currently starting his way at um, Abley as his new employer. And he has to do some, some projects uh, as part of the onboarding, as far as I understood from, from his tweet, tweets. And one thing is about um, Agile uh, planning poker. And he built an app for that, uh, making use of Vue and um, Azure Static Web Apps and, of course, Azure Functions. And this project is also available on GitHub. So if you want to take a look at the Agile Flush and the, the Azure Static Web Apps that are used and Azure Functions in version 4, so um, the most up-to-date version, then or Azure Function Core Tools version 4, so the, the workers version 4, and node 16, then um, I think that's a quite nice um, starting point. Now, another news from the area of um, serverless, blog post by Chris Gillum on resetting your durable functions task hub state. So this blog post guides you through if you want to reset that, that state, for example, when you do a deployment of a new version of the durable functions or of your durable functions app, and you want to get rid of all the history of the prior executions, then this blog post guides you through that. There are also some useful links in there around um, zero downtime deployments and versioning. And um, the blog post does not restrict itself to the um, Azure storage as a, as a backend for um, durable functions, but also for uh, answers the question for Netherite and the new MS SQL storage backend that are in um, in a pre not in a preview mode in a, in an alpha or beta state um, available at the moment. So um, again, 
super uh, useful, super helpful blog post around that topic. With that, let's lightly move to the containers, starting with um, serverless containers, so Azure Container Apps. There was a super cool meetup this week, um, um, the, the Azure Rosenheim meetup, hosted by, by White Duck. And this meetup was mainly about the Azure Container Apps, starting with some overview on what options do you have to run containers within um, Azure? And what shared responsibilities do you have? So super cool overview there. And then the, the main part of the session was about um, the Azure Container Apps and how they how they work. And there was quite some, some extended hands-on on that. And also what are the current limitations? So that was highly appreciated um, to see where are currently shortcomings. I mean, it's in public preview, so it's not yet GA but it's definitely worth taking a look at. And the uh, session finished then with some generic overview about news, what, what happened in the last month, I would say, within um, the, the AKS ecosystem. Then another topic around um, AKS. So you can now create uh, chaos, chaos experiments using uh, Chaos Mesh in order to check the resiliency of your um, AKS setup. So the Azure Chaos Studio, um, which, which is using under the hood Chaos Mesh, is um, able to do that. And I've referenced the official documentation for that topic that is um, quite new, um, that guides you through how you can achieve that and how you can make your setup more resilient. Then this week, there was also another event, the AWS reInvent. Um, and there have been some announcements that are also of interest for the, for the broader ecosystem in the container world, from my perspective. And one announcement was the um, open sourcing of um, a project called Carpenter, which is um, a way to provision just-in-time nodes for Kubernetes clusters. So if you want to, to scale up, if you want to provide more, more nodes, then um, this tool might be um, worth a look um, within the Kubernetes workspace. I'm not quite sure if, if it's super perfectly usable already outside of the AWS world, but at least that's, that's the goal to have it working um, everywhere. What I learned is I think it's, it's really, really quite new. So some links might still um, need to have some some redirection, so some lead to a 4, 400 error. Um, but uh, I think quite interesting to read. Then another announcement that came out this week that was a bit of a surprise um, around the uh, Knative project. So the Knative project is now applying for um, CNCF, namely to become a CNCF incubating project. So the, the, the first level, if you want to come into CNCF. So Google is willing to donate the um, Knative project to CNCF. Now there are different um, yeah, rumors why they do that. I, I have no, no idea what's, what's the motivation to do that, but I think it's quite uh, good to have also this project under the uh, CNCF umbrella to have the community taking it from there. Now let's see, I, I would assume that it gets an incubating project, so the application is out, but let's see what happens. And then moving a bit into the, the hybrid world of uh, Kubernetes, namely um, Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes clusters, there is one functionality that I would like to highlight, which is currently available in preview. And that's the Azure Key Vault Secrets provider extension for Arc enabled Kubernetes clusters. Quite short name. For a service. Um, but the, the functionality is, from my perspective, super important because now within Arc enabled Kubernetes cluster, you can use um, Azure Key Vault as a secrets provider um, because, in, in most cases, you do not want to use Azure Secrets for that. You usually use some um, functionality outside of your cluster, be it HashiCorp Key Vault or, or Azure Key Vault. And within um, Azure Arc enabled key, uh, and Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes clusters. I mean, it makes perfect sense to provide Azure Key Vault um, for that. That's that's really cool. Uh, currently in preview, so not GA yet. 
Now, with that, let's switch to the area of DevOps and let's first start with some announcements around um, news from, from GitHub. First of all, the, the team sync, so syncing the um, uh, member groups of an IDP within GitHub is now also available for Okta. Up to now, it was just a GA for um, Azure Active Directory. So if you're using Okta as ADP, you can now also make use of that functionality. Then um, one improvement around workflows that are triggered by Dependabot. They now um, receive Dependabot secrets, so uh, that makes your work a bit smoother when you are using uh, private package registries. So this is now um, a more decent way um, that the workflows will, will run more decently. You, you do not have to, to wrap your head around that. All the secrets are injected there when you have a private package registry. Then one thing that was out quite some time uh, now um, on GitHub is reusable workflows. And now um, GitHub Actions reusable workflows is GA. So you can use that and have full support around uh, this one, which will now really put the um, ability to, to use GitHub Actions in a, in a really broader way and, and reuse some parts of the workflows. That's really great to have that in place. Now, with that, uh, there is also a quite fitting blog post to that topic that came out this week about refactoring GitHub Action workflows. So maybe you started with GitHub Actions workflows and you, you did not have uh, <clears throat> the reuse in place, of course, because it wasn't there at the beginning. Um, and now you want to um, drag drag out the reusable parts of your workflow and make your GitHub Actions workflow more modularized, then I would recommend this blog post that I have referenced within the show notes about refactoring GitHub Action workflows, which gives you some, some hints, some ideas on how to do that. Example is an Azure Static Web App, but um, I mean, you can transfer that to any other scenario. Then one topic that kind of accompanies the the last few um, weeks of this podcast, namely the BICEP registry and how to use the BICEP registry and how to set up um, everything around the BICEP registry. And there is another blog post by Barbara Forbes that, Forbes that I would like to highlight here. And that's around, um, the again, the setup of deploying from a BICEP registry in Azure DevOps, as well as with uh, GitHub Actions. And this blog post mainly focuses on the on the setup. So what permissions do you need? Um, how can you deploy between different tenants and so on? And this one um, really guides you through that in a, in a very wide, nice way. And as the, the title states, it's not only focusing on GitHub Actions, but um, also on Azure DevOps. Then one other service that um, is in preview now and is, of course, interesting for all things around DevOps, and that's the Azure Load Testing Service, which allows you, or which is a managed service, a fully managed service on Azure in order to bring forward your load testing and optimizing the performance of your app when you run into high load scenarios. So um, the blog post that I've referenced within the show notes is the um, official announcement of that and <clears throat> gives you all the links and further information if you want to get started with this um, very well integrated load testing service in the um, Azure ecosystem. Then one announcement, um, also a GA announcement from one thing that I personally think was the, the coolest announcement during um, Ignite. Uh, that's the Surface Adaptive Kit. So, um, I referenced that when I presented the Book of News as, as one of the highlights, and I think it's still the highlight for me because that shows that Microsoft cares about um, people who might have, um, well, disabilities and might have um, problems with using their devices. And it's a really, from my perspective, super simple way. And they really tested that and discussed with people who have disabilities how they can improve working with, with the uh, devices. And yeah, it's now GA, so uh, GA, so to say, you, you can buy it, um, spread the word. I think that's really uh, super cool. 
With that, let's switch to the world in between SAP and Microsoft. And as every week, of course, there is the SAP on Azure Video Podcast this week uh, with updates on the Azure Monitor for SAP. So there have been quite some improvements over the last months based on customer feedback on uh, the Azure Monitor in conjunction with um, uh, SAP workloads. So very, very SAP specific improvements there and this uh, session guides you through. There is also one thing that is mentioned in the session that I would like to highlight, the um, Festive Tech Calendar. Thanks to Holger to mention that, um, is up and running since 1st of December. So um, subscribe to the YouTube channel of the Festive Tech Calendar um, and enjoy tons of videos that will come out over this month, all completely community driven. You can also donate to um, a Black House of Code. Um, that's um, really, really cool, highly appreciated. Then, um, another news from the area of SAP Microsoft, another blog post by Martin Pankratz around the uh, private link service that is available on BTP in beta, um, where you can also contribute to the documentation, as I mentioned before. Um, this is now part seven of the series, and it's all about setting up SSL um, with private link, um, namely the, the SSL end-to-end set up for that service. So if you're using that service, then, well, of course, all the other six parts are also highly recommended. If you want to, to make a feedback with the SSL stuff, then this blog post will help you a lot. Quite interesting to see if this series will hit double-digit numbers at some point. Now, um, with that, let's switch to the area of um, learning and events. There I have one thing which is food for thought. As I said, this week was the AWS reInvent and Werner Vogel, CTO of um, AWS, also brought out a blog post around tech predictions for 2022 and beyond. I think quite interesting um, read on, on his thoughts about these uh, predictions. Of course, also usable outside the AWS world. Then um, one event that I would like to highlight that is happening in two to three days. So it's on the 7th of December, a completely virtual event. It's the Azure Developer Community Day that um, takes place. It's completely uh, free of charge so um, and completely uh, online. I have referenced the um, landing page of the Azure Developer Community Day within the show notes. There you find the, the link to get the free tickets. Um, in order to have access to the sessions. When you um, land on the, on the page or when you open it and you scroll down to the agenda, this is something that I want to highlight. It's a little bit, or I was confused a bit. Um, you have four tracks and they are represented by some bubbles. And the bubbles are so, so semi-transparent and I was quite surprised there's only an IoT track. Perhaps I'm too old and my, my eyes are too bad, but. Um, that there are four bubbles and you have to click on the bubbles in order to land on the track. So there is not only an IoT track, there is also an open track with, with different topics, um, quite interesting talks. First one um, on the open track, for example, by um, Yannick Fillion about um, um, using holograms or holography for, for, for helping people. Um, I know that talk, definitely worth watching. Then, of course, there is um, Cloud Native and Serverless, probably most interesting for, for some for me. And there is a collaboration and no code track. Um, yeah, so I think quite quite interesting day, um, quite some talks to, to listen to. If you have the time, I think that's some well spent, well, talks that you should listen to. And then um, let's wrap up this session with one announcement around the GitHub Copilot. So maybe you're one of the, the happy folks that um, have access to the, or have early access to GitHub Copilot. And there is now an improvement that is super cool. And that's uh, GitHub Copilot Labs. And this GitHub Copilot Labs allows you to, to select code and ask Copilot to explain what's happening within this part of code. 
I think that's that's super useful, especially if you start with code or if you start with a new project and you're not sure what's really happening in this part of code. Um, like for me, when I'm looking at .NET code, um, that, that's really super cool. I have not yet tried it out, but it looks super promising. Now with that, I'm at the end of today's show. I hope I had some news for you, some interesting stuff, some stuff to catch up. Um, and with that, I wish you a nice Saturday, a great Sunday, and a successful next week. Until next Saturday. Bye.